welcome to the Religious Studies Project. My name is Christopher Carter and I am joined as ever by David Robertson. How are you, David? I'm very well. I'm enjoying the recent sunshine. Exactly. Well, not not today. A little bit drizzly. Indeed. But, you know, what can you do? What can you do? Um, we It's good are, for the garden. That is true. And your allotment. And my allotment, well. yeah. Um, we are bringing you an interview today that David recorded with um, Professor Anne Taves of the um, University of California of Santa Barbara. And um, they spoke about worldviews and ways of life. And I believe, uh, will Alcoholics Anonymous come up in the interview? Alcoholics Anonymous was the kind of main case study she used. Um, yeah, we talk a, a little bit about it here today, but I'll I'll uh, I'll come back to that mm-hmm. afterwards. And um, if you're interested in that, you should check out our, our previous podcast with Wendy Dossett on um, religion and addiction recovery. But for now, over to David and Anne. It's my pleasure to be joined today by Professor Anne Taves from the Religious Studies Department at the University of California, Santa Barbara. Um, not her first visit to the podcast, but uh, the first full-length interview, I think, so this should be interesting. Um, she's here in Edinburgh to deliver the Gunning Lectures um, and... That's where the topic of today's discussion has come from, um, talking about uh, worldviews and ways of life. Um, so let's start where we were kind of already talking before I started recording um, a little bit, maybe about how 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 did this how did we come to this position? You were you were asked to write a, a blog, is that right? Yeah. Um... <clears throat> I mean, really, the question is, why am I even talking about worldviews and ways of life or studying religion as worldviews and ways of life, which was the topic of the gunning lectures? And as we were just talking about before, I was um, pretty much just what I would call an anti-definitionalist when it comes to defining religion for research purposes because I think it's really important that we look at how people understand all the religion and other related sorts of terms on the ground. But I was kind of forced to make a more constructive move, um, internally forced, um, after I was asked to write a blog post on method for the Non-Religion and Secularity Project. And it just struck me, that talking about non-religion and religion without ever specifying any larger category or rubric under which these two items fell was kind of absurd. Yeah. So that got me searching for, you know, trying to answer the question, what do these two things have in common? And terms like worldviews and ways of life are actually very widely used as an overarching framework for talking about these things. And in fact, Lois Lee's first objection to the worldviews language was it was too commonplace and too ordinary. Uh, Yeah. And there's a, there's a question there, you know, why uh, ordinary and commonplace that's should be fine. Really? (laughs) I mean, that's part of the the Protestant thing, isn't it? That religion should be special and set apart, but. um... Yeah. I I think her concern and I'm putting words in her mouth. So she uh, can can respond if she wants. Right. right. I think um, her concern was actually one that came up in the Q and a after my first lecture um, the ease with which everyday definitions of worldviews might get confused with whatever we might want to mean by it in a more technical sense. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And that's a problem. I mean, that's one of our problems with defining religion. Yes. That we construct so. these technical definitions of what we mean, but then everybody has their meanings on the ground. What I'm arguing with worldviews and ways of life is that we actually can define them in a way that I'm arguing can stabilize them in a way that we can't 
stabilize definitions of religion. That religion is a complex cultural concept. It simply does not have a stable meaning. Mm -hmm. But worldviews and ways of life, I think that we can root them in an evolutionary perspective and show how the ability to actually generate a worldview um, is something that humans could do that's grounded in uh, evolved capacities, basically, that emerge out of all mobile organisms having a way of life. That's really interesting. I'm going to get you to take us through some of that um you know, albeit in a truncated way later on. Um, first though, I think we need to, we need to jump back a little bit. And so uh, tell us what you mean by worldviews. And uh, you also use this term way, ways of life. Yeah. Um, so just unpack for the listeners a little bit, um, yeah. what we mean by these terms. Well, um, let me start with worldviews. Mm-hmm. Um, basically there's, Um, there's a range of scholarship on worldviews. There there still is an interdisciplinary group in uh, Belgium, and there are scholars, anthropologists such as Andre Drugers in Amsterdam, who've been working on this idea of worldviews. And generally in this literature, uh, they define worldviews in terms of what I would call big, questions. Mm -hmm. So the kind of, they use the fundamental terms that you hear in philosophy. So terms like ontology, cosmology, epistemology, anthropology, axiology, praxeology. Those are the big philosophical concepts, but we can translate those into very everyday language. And so that's basically how um, Adel Asperma and I are working to define worldviews in terms of answers to these six fundamental big questions. Can you uh, give us a couple of examples maybe of, yeah. of those as questions? Yeah, so the ontology questions would be what exists, what's real. And the cosmology question would start with the very basic question of either who am I or who are we, mm-hmm. but it would expand to where do we come from? Where do we, where are we going? Um, the anthropology question would it be, what is our situation? What's the situation in which we find ourselves? It could also then expand to what is our nature? Mm-hmm. Um, but two really c- crucial questions. Well, let me just give you all of them because in relation to the, what's real and who are we, where are we going question. Next question is the epistemology question. How do we know that? Mm -hmm. And Mm so, you know, you get answers from human beings of science or revelation or things like that. But then after the one about our situation um, would come the question of goals and values. So what's the good or what's the goal Mm -hmm. that we should be striving for? And then, Finally, the big path or action question, how do we get there? (laughs) So um, we're arguing that, you know, we can use this set of questions to just to unpack lots of things from at a very high level uh, teachings of a broad tradition um, all the way down to the how individuals would answer that question so there's a real scalability to this exactly exactly and so these build into uh people am i understanding correctly that the the responses to these questions become embodied in ways of life would that be correct yeah yeah we're arguing that all mobile organisms uh broadly speaking have what we can think of as a way of life, but this, you know, the more basic the organism, the more basic the way of life, there's not going to be choices. There's certainly not going to be any mental reflection Mm -hmm. on way of life. Right. So ways of life can get more and more complicated, but we see that as one of the ways that we can talk about humans as evolved animals. 
And we want to stress both continuity and difference. We're trying to do a both and kind of thing rather than an either or. Okay. <laughs> um, but you were asking then for humans, how do worldviews relate to ways of life? Yeah. And, and prior to that, how the big questions relate to ways of life and worldviews? Yeah. How, yeah. What's the direct relationship? Yeah. yeah. Well, we're, we're distinguishing, um, and I keep saying we because Agla Asprem and I've been collaborating on some of this work. Mm-hmm. Um, we're talking about modes of worldview expression. So, um, and we're distinguishing between enacted, articulated, and recounted mm-hmm. worldviews. And so recounted would include both oral traditions where things are memorized and textualized traditions. But before you even get to recounting, we've just got articulating a worldview in language. And then prior to that, mm-hmm. we've got the fact that they can be enacted without even being articulated. Yeah. And yeah. so all these levels can work together and interact. And so at the enacted level, you've basically got implicit worldviews embedded in a way of life. And as researchers, we would have to extract or, or infer answers to people, to the big questions based on people's actions and behavior. So is it with this um, embodied, um, recounted um, level? Is that where we start talking about worldviews rather than simply ways of life? Yeah, yeah. So that we're arguing that basically you have to have a cultural capacity before you can have a worldview. And so we use a distinction on the one hand between natural and cultural affordances that we borrow from uh, ecological psychology and also a distinction between um, evolved and cultural schemas, which are a psychological construct for the kinds of representations that we have for things. And the distinction between natural and cultural is that natural affordances or uh, evolved schemas are very much, there's a direct relationship between the organism and the environment. Okay. There's no mediating uh, possibility for some kind of cultural construct that well, organisms have agreed upon together. Okay. It's not until we get to humans that, as far as we know, we have those more collective kinds of agreements about things that can be detached from the environment. So maybe something like, um, you think you've seen something in the shadows and you're frightened of it might be a schema. You know, there's an embodied reaction of fear. Yeah. But that you saw a ghost and were, you're therefore frightened of ghosts right. becomes that's more of a, a, a worldview. Yeah, yeah. Or, or at least part of a, a way of yes, life. Yes, it's drawing in a cultural schema. A collective cultural schema. Yeah, yeah about ghosts. Yeah. And layering that on top of the evolved schema of when you, he- when you hear a sound or you see more likely when you perceive some sort of movement. Yeah. Right. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. We have an evolved tendency to assume there's something animate there, something potentially dangerous. And potentially that then would also tie into a larger view of the world because in order to have ghosts going about, you have to have some sort of notion of right. survival after death or, you know, exactly. or non real beings of right. some sort. Yeah. Right, right, right. Yeah. So you can expand from that in in steps to develop a larger underlying conception of how they would think how they would describe what's real in the world right and what's nice about the scheme i think is that it it's definitely a bottom up approach to this rather than a top down right. so we're starting with um the most basic kind of uh, responses 
and then building up to uh, the, the worldviews from there? Well, certainly if you want to start at the level of individual behavior, but we actually can start in all kinds of places, as long, I would argue, as we're being responsible about the nature of our starting points. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> I mean, as long as we're upfront about that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, I think, as you know, I've been teaching a comparing worldviews type course where, which is an attempt to overcome some of the problems with the world religions paradigm. Mm -hmm. And which our listeners should by now be very familiar with. <laughs> exactly, exactly. That's kind of why I brought it up in this context, because I figured it might be relevant. Yeah, yeah. But um there starting with a textbook depiction of the teachings mm -hmm. of a so called world religion, we can I can have the students analyze that in terms of the big questions to give themselves a basic sort of framework that I can then analyze or, or show them using historical materials, how over time um, that those answers to the big questions coalesced into some sort of, say, orthodoxy or mm -hmm. some sort of tradition, including looking at the power structures and the authority of structures that would make it coalesce mm -hmm. um, into being that. But it doesn't mean that every individual or all the groups all adhere to that. But we can still start at that level and use this conception that way, is my point. How in uh, the answer to this might just be not at all, but how is this in any way kind of related to what Ninian Smart was trying to do, or oh. at least what Ninian Smart said he was trying to do? Right. No, I I think um, there is a relationship, and I think it's important to see both what Ninian Smart did that I think is extremely positive and the limitations of what he did. Um, so the really positive thing is articulated in a kind of obscure article that I think we ought to, you know, more of us ought to be aware of, mm -hmm. in which um, he basically argued that we ought to subsume the philosophy of religion under the philosophy of worldviews, mm -hmm. the um, history of religions in the broad religions geschichte sense under the history of worldviews and the anthropology of religion under an anthropology of worldviews. Mm -hmm. So sort of the whole range of methodologies that we tend to use in religious studies, he saw as part of an expansive con uh, conception of worldview studies. And I think that's really cool. Yeah. The, the, limitation is that he never defined what he meant by a worldview. And what he did was simply import his six or later seven dimensions of religion from the study of religion to the study of worldviews. Yeah. And to me, that was kind of importing you know, that was almost a new version of the sort of missionary move of taking our definition of religion and now applying it to worldviews. Yeah, and the the choice of the dimensions and the relative weighting of them, it kind of speaks to that. So, you know, like texts is there. and um, But also, I mean, it, I, I'm not sure where exactly, but he certainly states at one point that, you know, obviously while we can view all of these things as worldviews, some of them are more profound than others. Right. right. So, you know, there's implicitly right. he's still making distinctions. Right, right, right. right. And, and of course, you know, Christianity is going to be right at the top. I mean, I would put <laughs> right. money on that. Right. And part of what our move to view worldviews and ways of life from an evolutionary perspective mm -hmm. is it kind of turns that on its head. Because it makes the highly rationalized, highly systematized 
worldviews that philosophers and theologians are into, and maybe even world religions textbooks, um, into a very high-end product that may or may not have that much relationship to everyday life, or at least has a very open, I mean, it's a very open question, as scholars of so-called live religion would mm. argue, to how people live their everyday lives. So part of what we see working from the bottom up is a lot of open questions about how integrated are people's enacted worldviews? Do they need to articulate them in order to function? Or can an enculturated way of life be perfectly sufficient until it's challenged in some way by something or other that then maybe people start to have to think about it on a need-to-know basis. Sorry to interrupt the episode, but we just wanted to let you know to remind you about our Patreon link. Uh, The Religious Studies Project has always been free since its inception, uh, but we know that there's a great problem in academia with uh, people not being paid for the work that they're expected to do, particularly early career scholars. And we at the RSP want to be part of the solution, not part of the problem. So you can help if you can spare even one pound a month um, by going to patreon.com slash Project RS and subscribing. We know that these podcasts are very useful for people who are teaching and people in their learning. So if you can help um, either by subscribing there or by making a one-off donation using the PayPal button on our website, it'd be greatly appreciated and will help us keep bringing you this podcast for free and fight against exploitation in academia. But now, back to the episode. And this is something that really interests me, actually. And you, uh, you said something about this. Um, I think you said that the we can see external um uh, f- uh, what's the 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 term you used uh, schemas we can see schemas that are external to us you know in other societies very easily but it's very difficult to see the schemas in our own which obviously is something that you know that scholars we're trained to do and we right. try and inculcate that in our students as well um but I was thinking about um I'm very interested in the idea of uh, challenging the, I, the idea of belief in the study of religion. I think there's mm-hmm. a lot of stress put on this is people's beliefs. And when you actually look at the data on the ground, people are not consistent in these kind of things. Beliefs are not um, performative statements which people hold in their brain and then act in accordance to. Um, and for instance, we have ideas like situational belief um, where people will respond differently in different circumstances. And I certainly saw this a lot in my research on, on New Age that uh, and conspiracy theories that, for instance, people who are suffering from chronic pain mm-hmm. will change their position or, um, or adopt multiple positions on alternative therapies, for instance. They may be the most scientifically minded person going, but when uh, painkillers no longer work, they're willing to subjunctively... Um, entertain the idea that mm-hmm. acupuncture or flower remedies or something mm-hmm. else might work. Um, and then, of course, if those seem to work, they may completely change their worldview. Um, I, or not completely. Mm. Okay. Yeah. So take it. You, you can see where I'm. Um, yeah. Because they may still be going to a more conventional physician or healer. Yeah. At yeah. the same time. Mm hmm. So they may, people may actually be able to keep multiple variant, uh, implicit worldviews going without thinking really carefully about the conflicts between them, as mm-hmm. long as the conflicts aren't causing them any problems. So are we, is that, a, are we seeing people then ma- moving between different schemas? Uh, are they moving between different worldviews then? Or, or, it, it, are, are, are we able to negotiate multiple schemas um, in different Yeah, I, I mean, I think, let me answer that a couple ways. Because if we think about other animals who would have evolved schemas mm-hmm. that would be cued by the environment, then to elicit certain behaviors in certain situations, then certainly we could think that we have that, you know, at that basic level, we have tons of schemas that get differentially cued by different environmental 
contexts. Um, each of those contexts would be, you know, a whole situation where we could ask, you know, what's the situation in which we find ourselves? What's the goal in this situation? What is the means to get to the goal? What kind of action? So in that sense, we could begin to flesh out, you know, kind of a micro worldview in that, or micro um, answers to the big questions in that context. So part of the thing to keep in mind, I think, is that the answers to the big questions don't have to be super big sounding. <laughs> yeah, yeah. No, absolutely, yeah. <laughs> Um, but at a more human level, I think another way to think about your question that again came up in our discussions was to think about it in re relation to people that are bicultural. Mm -hmm. And it seems to me there's an analogy between the kinds of, um, people dealing with medical problems, switching between sort of healing frames, we could call it, um, that could develop into a whole consistent way of life, yeah. but could just be these partial things that people can flip back and forth between. Mm -hmm. And if we look at um, bicultural people, they get cued to speak different languages, bring whole different sets of cultural schemas into play when they're, you know, with their relatives, wherever their family came from, or when they're with their family mm. in their new context. Yeah, interestingly, I didn't mention this when we were talking about this yesterday, but I, I mean, I, because I've worked in catering for a long time, I've known a lot of bicultural people. Uh. Um, and several of them have said to me that their personality is slightly different. Um, in when they're in the other register, like I, I've known uh, that French friend of mine says she's much more sarcastic um, and sort of aggressive with her French family and friends than she is with with her Scottish uh, friends, for instance. Yeah, see, I think that's really interesting. I mean, and that's she's saying she's answering the big question about who am I mm -hmm. with different answers. Differently, yeah, yeah, yeah. and. I think we need a language to make sense of that, to explore that. And and that's part of what I see is the power of this approach. It seems to me there's a whole lot of different directions mm -hmm. that we can use it to explore. Um, yeah, so let's uh, pursue that then um, briefly. I mean, you talked in, in the Gunning Lectures, you used the example of the AA um, quite a lot. And I thought you could maybe talk us quite quickly through um, through that, just uh, so the listeners have a, a sort of a, a real world example to play with. So taking the Alcoholics Anonymous, um, a group that's kind of, uh, you know, a debatable case, an edge case as to whether we're talking about something that's religious or not. So yeah, let's, uh, yeah. let's see how the model works. Okay, well, that was exactly why I picked it, because mm. they're adamant that they are not a religion. Absolutely. Yeah. And so, uh, Alcoholics Anonymous is happy to call itself a spiritual, as embodying a spiritual path or a spiritual way of life. They actually use the way, the way of life kind of language or call themselves a fellowship. So that was part of why I picked them, plus the fact that I know a fair amount about them, so it seemed like an example I could spell out. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> um, it helps. Yeah. So part of what I did in the first lecture was just to show the variety of ways that we could analyze it. So in the first lecture, I talked about it at the sort of high level of itself as a group with official documents, um, you know, describing who they are collectively. And so I used the 12 steps and the 12 traditions, which are their core defining yeah. documents um, to analyze how, as an organization, they would officially answer the big questions. Not, they wouldn't, they don't officially answer the big questions, but how we could tease out their answers to the big questions based on their official documents. Okay. And then I indicated that we could look, we could take that analysis in two directions. We could compare it to other groups in the culture 
to help us better understand how they were trying to position themselves and why they wanted to call them, why they wanted to insist they were not a religion. Yeah. And it's basically because they wanted to argue that they're compatible, their path is compatible with any religion or none at all. Um, but then the other thing that I showed is how we could look at subgroups within AA or individual narratives within AA and examine the extent to which they buy the official conception that this is a generic spiritual path. And so um, I alluded to some of the different commentaries, feminist, Native American, Buddhist, Vedanta. You know, there's all these different attempts to translate the 12 steps into other Reli religious yeah, or spiritual yeah, terms. Yeah. Um, so that's the kind of thing that I was looking at in the first lecture, some of the big picture things we could do. Then in the second lecture, when I looked at the evolutionary perspective or foundations of worldviews, um, I used the kind of layered approach and the fact that um, developing the idea that we have these evolved schemas that, and also internalized cultural schemas that can lead us to act really quickly without thinking about it, mm -hmm. to tease apart um, Bill Wilson, the founder, one of the founders of AA, what he would describe as the sort of drinker's dilemma, which is that they can make this conscious choice to quit drinking yeah. and then have that immediately undermined when somebody hands them a drink. Mm -hmm. And so I use that to differentiate between an enacted way of life, which is I'm an alcoholic and a um, articulated way of life, which is I'm going to quit drinking and I have the willpower to do it. Yeah. yeah. Um, in the last lecture, I, looked at the emergence of AA and the transformation of the alcoholic as processes of change, both of groups and individuals, and so used um, this kind of analysis to analyze sort of the before and after and the transition from one way of life to another. So we're... Um, we're getting towards time now um so let's uh, let's switch to then to the the bigger questions you know why um so we're talking about maybe you know the idea of subsuming rs under a broader kind of umbrella of worldviews and stuff where we started but well, why is this so why is this so important now um what this this has some strong resonances with the field, uh, with issues within the field generally at the moment, I think. Um, and it would be good to speak to that briefly. Yeah. Um, I think I'm frustrated with the field on a couple of levels. I'm frustrated with what strikes me as the continuing spinning of our wheels when it comes to critique. We're, yeah. we're very good at critiquing and identifying all the problems with the concept of religion. Um, but I don't see that much effort being put into solving the problems. And too often I see the, pro the potential solutions, including this one, being shot down because it might undermine our departments <laughs> yes. and our and so to speak, our way of life. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> so even if it might be more responsible intellectually, more consistent intellectually, we want to safeguard our way of life. And therefore, we're not going to go there and we're going to continue to spin our wheels conceptually. Mm -hmm. I find that really frustrating, although I certainly understand why we might want to protect our way of life. Um, the other frustration for me is... the kind of polarization between people that are deeply committed to a humanistic approach to the study of religion and people that are trying to approach it from 
a more scientific or cognitive scientific point of view. Mm -hmm. And I really see myself as trying to bridge between those two. And I strongly would argue for the value of both approaches. It's not an either or kind of thing. Yeah. Yeah. So taken together, um, this kind of approach that I'm talking about is designed one to offer a constructive kind of option, get us beyond just critique and second to bridge between the humanistic and the scientific approaches. So, you know, I just like to see more of us engaging in both bridge building and trying to solve some of our problems. Um, yeah, and we, you know, at the Religious Studies Project, those are two issues that we, well, certainly the former, you know, of, of moving beyond critique is something that we've uh, we've taken quite seriously. And the interdisciplinary, I mean, we we feature a lot of of psychology and cognitive people on um but proper interdisciplinary work you know work that that builds on both sides equally is it's rare but it's also challenging to do i think it's it's oh. um you know we we this is maybe a legacy of of the way that the field's construed you, we're already kind of you know i've had to learn sociology and history um you know as methodologies i mean just right. in a standard rs right. context and to then start building in psychology and cognitive studies you know it's 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 a big ask i totally agree it is a big ask and it really i've been motivated to do it because i find it really fascinating and mm. so if people don't have an kind of internal curiosity driving them to do it. Um, you know, it's probably going to be pretty tough, mm -hmm. but on the other hand, people could be more open to those who are interested in doing it. But the second thing that I think we need to be really aware of is that people in the sciences tend to work collaboratively and people in the humanities tend to be single author yeah. type folks. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And so the more, um, of this kind of bridge building work I've been trying to do, the more I've been collaborating. So, you know, just in this conversation, I've been mentioning Egil Aspram. Mm -hmm. I've been working with him on this worldviews and ways of life stuff. But when we decided to work out some of these ideas for a psychology journal, we enlisted a psychologist as a third author <laughs> And we're also working um, on another paper that I'm going to be giving at an evolution of religion conference where I'm going to argue about, well, why are we talking about the evolution of religion? Mm -hmm. Shouldn't we be talking about the evolution of worldviews and ways of life? But anyway, we're enlisting an evolutionary psychologist as a third author on that paper mm -hmm. so that, you know, I want to have that kind of collaborative input so that I'm more confident that the ways that um, we're pushing these ideas make sense to people who are deeply vested in those particular fields. So it's one thing to kind of sketch a big picture, but it's another thing to present it with the kind of detail that people in that specializing in that area would want to have. Absolutely. Absolutely. And, um, you know, I know this myself from, uh, the limited amount of collaboration I've had in terms of working with the conspiracy theory scholars, because I'm, you know, as a religion trained in religious studies, I'm kind of a minority there. Um, probably 50% of them are um, psychologists and maybe 30% mm -hmm. are sort of political science. So very yeah. different methodologies, but um, it's very clear that the next stage in the scholarship needs to take the humanities um critique and analysis and understanding of terms together with the kind of data generating ability yep. and the analysis on, in you know, quantitative analysis that they can do. Um, and so, yeah, I, I think there's a very timely call and, uh, probably a good, a good place to, to leave on that kind of, yep. uh, rousing yep. <laughs> call to action. Um, so I'm just going to say, uh, thanks so much for joining us today. Um, thank you. Yeah, well, thank you for having me, David. My pleasure. Thank you.
wonderful to hear from the two of you there and i've spent a good few days in edinburgh towards the end of march and she was very generous with her time and very interested in in all the projects that were happening here Um, so it was wonderful to to hear the uh the rsp output the rsp impact from that visit yeah it was um it was nice hanging out with her and getting to know her it's one of those um, occasions which thankfully is not that rare where you know somebody's work and you know they've maybe been on the podcast or something but somebody else has interviewed them and then you you actually meet them and they're as nice as you Mm. would hope and it's it's also really good to hear you know they've obviously they're a UCSB with Anne and Egil Asprim and everything. There's a, they have a lot of resources to do these sort of big, big, well, the big questions that mm-hmm. he's looking mm-hmm. at and large scale work and it, that many of us don't really have a chance um, to do. Um, so it is encouraging to know that that is also happening at the same time. It's sort of the, the other side of the coin to a lot of the uh, sort of in depth qualitative work that, that we're maybe more familiar with. Yeah. Um, and that sort of grand theorizing is, uh, it's maybe not as, as popular as it has been mm. in, in different periods of time. So it's nice to, it's nice to see people still attempting it and yeah. pushing, you know, the pushing that angle. But also empirically grounded in a way that, that yeah. such grand theorizing usually doesn't tend to be. Yeah. I mean, bringing in the, the, the cognitive aspect particularly is, is a, a different take on that. Yeah. Um, but you know, you mentioned, um, Alcoholics Anonymous. I think she's going to be publishing the, the full lectures at some point, probably as a book or, um, as part of a book, um, where she'll develop those case studies in a lot more depth. I mean, we did a very much a rush through a very large, um, and multifaceted mm-hmm. kind of idea. So, um, you'll be able to dig into that in more depth. But talking about Alcoholics Anonymous, um, Wendy Dossett, who we mentioned at the beginning, is preparing uh, a special edition of Implicit Religion mm-hmm. on um, addiction, recovery, and its relationship to religious narratives from a critical perspective, which will be very interesting. Um, hopefully, when you're listening to this, we should have either just published or are just about to publish our next special edition, which is on AI and religion, guest edited by... Um, our very own Beth Singler. I think yeah, yeah. I can say that. She won't be too angry with me. Um, and featuring um, Ting Guo, who we studied with a few years back. And yeah. also uh, one Jonathan Tuckett, who uh, you may have heard of. You may have seen <laughs> videos of him uh, ranting at you somewhere on the internet. Uh, or if not, uh, you lucky, lucky people. <laughs> <laughs> but if uh, any of the, the listeners um, want to send us uh, proposals for papers, uh, please do. Um, we, you know, we're finally getting the journal into the place that we want it to be as the journal of the religious studies project. So if you've got papers which engage with the idea of religion from a critical perspective, um, or interesting, uh, empirical data, uh, please, uh, drop us an email and I'll give you more details. Absolutely. Um, we've got a, another treat for you next week. Um, Paulina Colata, um, who did, few interviews for us maybe coming on three years ago i remember with ian reader and erica buffelli um uh, she's come back um, to do some more interviews for us um she's now i think based at the university of manchester um writing up her phd in japanese studies um so on that note she's been speaking with uh, levy mclaughlin and i'm afraid my pronunciation here mightn't be fantastic but the title is soko gakai komaito and the religious voices of Japan's political arena. So another area of the world that is underrepresented in the RSP. So we're delighted to have that interview. Yeah, um, that'll be very interesting. I thought you did a good job with the pronunciation there, actually. So, you know. Hats off to me. Uh, (laughs) Indeed, I was was trying to think of um, well done in Japanese, but there was no chance of that, frankly. Um, I don't think there's much more to say. Is there anything else, Chris? Uh, Arigato, wishy mushy, <laughs> and thanks for listening. <laughs> 
The Religious Studies Project is sponsored by the British Association for the Study of Religions, the North American Association for the Study of Religion, and the International Association for the History of Religions. Brought to you by Founders and Editors-in-Chief Chris Cotter and David Robertson, and Managing Editor Thomas J. Coleman III. Our features are edited by Jonathan Tuckett, and our opportunities digest by Yana Shirley. Podcast transcription by Helen Bradstock, with audio assistance from Gregory Schneider and Samuel Ward. Social media managed by Ray Radford, and sales and marketing by Sammy Bishop. Don't forget, you can support the project using our amazon.com.co.uk and .ca links or by donating at patreon.com backslash projectrs. And you can find us on Facebook, Twitter, Google+, YouTube, iTunes and other portals. <laughs>